thing that is missing that we need to define is this bottom piece. I, I need to understand how do I characterize my random process in a frequency domain, right? You see that, that that part is missing, right? We know how to do that for deterministic signals. How do I, how do I characterize deterministic signal in a frequency domain? Taking the Fourier transform of the signal itself. So that part is missing here for the random processes. I need to understand what sinusoidals do I need to use to build a particular random process. Now, this one, I'm, I'm OK. I know that to the impulse response, I can attach the frequency response, which are Fourier transform <coughs> pairs. And then I need a descriptor here that uh, tells me how do I characterize my output random process in a, in a frequency domain. Let me just ask you now blindly, you know, this is, you haven't seen this before, so let me see what's your intuition. I've shown here, for example, that uh, uh, autocorrelation function and of the input and output are related to some sort of convolution, right? You can see that autocorrelation function of the output is autocorrelation function of the input and convolving with some impulse response. Now, if I come up with a frequency domain descriptor here that is a counterpart to the autocorrelation function, what do you expect to see at the bottom? When, when you look at convolution in the time domain, what's the image of that for the frequency domain? Uh, multiplication, right? So I'm gonna, this is where what I expect to see, and we'll see how we get there. But uh, I expect to see that once I go from this time domain into frequency domain, there will be some a relationship where whatever is the equivalent representation of my random process in the frequency domain, on the input and the equivalent representation on the output are going to be related somehow to the product with this frequency response. Right? That's what my gut tells me. Right? So let's go formally and see how we actually get there. Right? But that's where we, what we expect to see based on our knowledge of, of, uh, of what happens <coughs> with deterministic signals. So how do I define the frequency domain uh, representation of the of the random process in a in a <coughs> frequency domain representation of the random process. We're going to define a quantity that is called power spectral density density of a random process. Now all of these DFs and so on. This one is called PSD. PSD stands for power spectral density. Okay. This is going to be our representation of the random process in a frequency domain. Let me formally define it, and then what I'll do is I'll tell you intuitively how you should understand this. Right? What is the meaning of this power spectral density? How do we define it? Well, we're going to start by saying x of t is a random process. Now, random process as such is usually not an energy signal. And some of them are, but a lot of them aren't. For example, if you look at noise, it goes forever. So it's a power signal, right? If you listen to me talking, it goes forever. So it's a power signal, too. So in order to formally define this power spectral density, we're going to do the same trick that allowed us to determine the Fourier transform of a, or similar trick that allowed us to do the Fourier transform of a, of a deterministic <coughs> signal. We're not going to look at the, the realization of the process as a whole, but we're going to look at its truncated version. And the truncated version becomes an energy signal, so it has a Fourier transform. And then we'll say, OK, well, let, let's uh, look at the truncated version where its duration goes to infinity and see what does that converge to. OK? So I'm going to define truncated version of a realization of x of t. Now, this one 
is going to be x t of t lambda i uh, for is um, actually is going to be equal to x of t lambda i when t is smaller than uh, t over 2 and 0 otherwise. So there's a lot of uh, uh, notational things here. I cannot try to use the same ones that they use in your book, but let me explain what is being meant by all of these. So here's the, here's the big picture. You start by random process x of t, but more practically, you start with a one realization of that process. So this is what they say. This is your x of t lambda i. This is i realization. Okay. If you remember our original concept here, this is the i point in the sample space where all possible realizations of the process reside. Now, instead of looking this whole thing, I'm going to, let's say this is 0, I'm going to look at uh, an interval that has a duration of t. So this is just the duration of t. And I'm going to define a signal that uh, looks somewhat like this. It is 0 outside of this interval. Then within this interval, it's the same as this signal. And then outside of the interval, it becomes 0 as well. Right? So that's my signal x t of t for a given lambda i as a, as a realization of this. Now, I can define this for every possible realization of my random process. So there is infinitely many of this truncated version, each one of the duration uh, equal to t. So let's uh, pick these versions. I'm going to kind of line them up here. And uh, let's just, uh, this is t, t, t. And this is my duration of capital T. So this is x t of t lambda 1. This one is here x t of t lambda 2, x capital T of t <coughs> lambda n, and so on. There's infinitely many of these guys. Each one of them are made 0 outside <coughs> of this interval. And then in, inside the interval, they kind of have certain behavior. All right. Whatever they may look like, right? So that's, uh, that's, uh, these are the truncated version. Now, what I do next is I, since each one of the truncated version now becomes an energy signal, it has a Fourier transform. So I can take the Fourier transform of this signal of each one of these signals, but instead of plotting the Fourier transform, I'm going to plot um, something that is going to be magnitude of the Fourier transform for the lambda 1 squared divided by t. So this is going to be the first one. This is going to be the second one. Let's say it may look somewhat different. So this is x of f <coughs> lambda 2 magnitude squared divided by t, and so on. So this is x of f lambda n magnitude squared divided by t. So how do I get here? Well, I take each one of these truncated versions, I take its Fourier transform, square it, and then divide by t. What is it that I'm actually doing here? Remember the interpretation of the, of the Fourier transform. 
it gave me the sinusoidals that are participating in building of this particular wave. Right? So here, I'm getting the, the distribution of the power between sinusoidals that are building this waveform. I'm getting distribution of powers that, um, that are building this waveform, distribution of the powers that are building this waveform, right? And I get, you know, all of these for all of these, all of these different distributions for all of these waveforms that I have here. And now I'm going to look at a single small frequency band here. And then I'm going to average all of these. So as a result of that, I end up with one frequency domain representation that is going to be uh, expected value of x of f lambda divided by t squared. So I'm going to take the average across all of these uh, Fourier transforms to obtain one single and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to define my s, x of f, power spectral density, or power spectral density, x of f, as a limit when t goes to infinity, 1 over t times x of f. Uh, actually, I should put t here. These are all uh, index t, right? x t of f lambda magnitude squared. <coughs> and this is what I call power spectral density. What is the meaning behind the power spectral density? Well, if you look at what is the meaning, how, how I constructed this, I'm looking at all possible realizations of the Mendel process. Through the Fourier transform here, I'm discovering what are the sinusoidals that are required to build any possible realization, right? What are sinusoidals that I need to build this? What are the sinusoidals that I need to build this? And so on. And then once I look at all of these possible sinusoidals that I need, that I, then I take the average across all possible realizations. So what I'm getting here is the sinusoidals that I need to build this process as a whole, right? It turns out here I have exaggerated a little bit, right? If this is a, some sort of ergodic stationary process, then chances are these are going to be very, very similar, right? Because remember, the Fourier transform is also a form of average, right? Where I take the, uh, uh, I'm taking an integral transform of my signal, right? So what I do is, um, I will probably get very similar uh, graphs here, and then when I average them, I'm going to get a single uh, function here of the frequency that tells me what is the individual contribution of a particular portion of the frequency domain to building of this kind of process. This is what we kind of talked about already. We not pointed, we didn't point it out there, but I already mentioned something like this. I already made a statement when I said, when you think about a voice, what is a bandwidth of voice? And we said, well, the voice extends from zero to four kilohertz. What is it that I'm referring to? You know, I'm referring to the power spectral density of the voice. The voice has components between zero and four kilohertz. So the voice, to build a voice signal, I need to use components that are in this frequency range. And outside, the contribution of the sinusoidals is going to be negligible, right? I'm talking telephone voice, right? And uh, that's how it is determined. So far, we haven't looked at voice as a, as a whole. We just looked at if, if I look if I have a signal that represents voice, I know it's going to be between 0 and 4 kilohertz. That was our message signal M of T. But now I'm extending everything, and I'm looking at a class of the signals, and I'm making a much power, more powerful claim. I'm saying not any particular signal is made out of frequencies between 0 and 4. But all voice signals can be built out of these, in these frequencies, even though they are different things that different people say and different, you know, uh, uh, in different voices. It turns out, statistically, they are all built out of components 
that are between 0 and 4 kilohertz. That's the statement of this power spectral density. And if I say power spectral density of the process, looks like this. Let's just look at this as now, not uh, general, but as an example. Then you can say, oh, this process is predominantly around DC. It is slowly varying because it has a high dominance of these of these low frequency components, they participate more, right? Because, they're, because this power spectral density is larger there. And then there is some variability on the top because the signal has these higher frequency components, uh, components as well. But this variability kind of goes, becomes uh, less and less powerful as you move away in a frequency domain. So this process is kind of predominantly slowly varying process that has some noise on the top of it as a result of these tails. Right? All of this I'm kind of concluding from this graph of a power spectral density. Because it tells me what sinusoidals are required to build this particular process. Any questions here? These are a little bit abstract concepts, right? This is not, not as straightforward. You have to spend some time thinking right, about it. And what I'll do is let me go through, we're, we're going to cover 